being, you're going to discuss that part of research at the AI Institute, uh, the, that are in social good or social harm, public health and epidemiology. And that is my best <coughs> guess to the uh, topics of interaction <coughs> with the college. And again, the whole idea is to start uh, more conversations with the colleagues in the College of Information and Communications, including high school and the College of Journalism, School of Journalism. Um, a, um, you may perhaps know, we, I moved with a small team of uh, six people uh, in 2019. It has been uh, about a year and a half. Uh, we've now grown to about 25 people or so. A um, lot more faculty recruiting to go, but uh, three more faculty members recruited and um, also postdocs and um, PhD students. Um, I have, uh, you know, three or four of them here with me who particularly work in this area. So they will join me uh, and will jointly present some of the projects and work we do. So uh, one of the, you know, the AI Institute uh, is both doing, doing both the core or foundational research in AI, but it is uh, investing equal time in translational research, research that is interdisciplinary and collaborative. And we, I think, already have uh, joint projects with uh, majority of colleges on the, um, on the campus. Um, and when I say we have collaborations, we may not have funded research yet, but we already have proposals submitted and our prototype build or, or, or you know, early um, something, um, some outcome like publications and other things have uh, come about. And a uh, hope is that in almost all of these cases will convert what has already started in terms of proposal to actual funding. And then um, um, do more and more larger projects, interdisciplinary pro projects and so on and so forth. Um, the outer circle in this ellipse uh, uh, indicates some of our um, areas of collaborations starts with uh, medicine, healthcare, nursing, um, there's disaster management, um, uh, manufacturing, uh, future factory, uh, public health, social good and harm, education, epidemiology, neuroscience. So these are some of the uh, areas where we already have collaborations and projects ongoing. And I think some of these would be of relevance to uh, College of Information and Communication. So um, this is, uh, I think this covers most of what we have in the area, areas that I thought would have a synergy. Uh, I won't be able to, we won't be able to talk about all of this today, uh, but we will, um, roughly talk about about half of this today or a little more than half of this today. Uh, the idea is to generally introduce the topic, the kind of problems we have solved, the kind of um, collaborations we have had with the domain scientists and experts. And um, it'll give you a sense of the kind of things we are capable of doing so that when uh, you have some ideas you want to pursue, we'll, you know, um, We'll, we'll, we'll have conversations and hopefully that will lead to joint work. Um, here, are, here is just, I wanted to, uh, because I can't talk about all, everything that we have done, you know, the time we have, I thought I'll just list the titles of the projects that, that we have conducted. Um, first one is harassment detection on social media then uh, crypto markets, uh, analysis of crypto markets to find illicit synthetic opioids, monitoring of cannabis and synthetic cannabinoid on social media, uh, substance abuse prevention uh, in rural Midwest. Uh, now we have moved here, so we are also doing South Carolina. Um, uh, social behavior uh, for healthcare utilization in depression. Um, Decision support for disaster management response, uh, multi-sensory mobile approach for personalized asthma care, uh, preventing juvenile repeat offenders. Um, again, organizational sense making immune response, prescription drug abuse, surveillance epidemiology. Now, these are um, 
uh, some titles of the proposals we have made. Uh, some are pending, some have been declined. But um, as, as the things go, we always you know, um, improve upon it and go back uh, when the opportunity again comes. So it kind of gives you a sense of the strategic direction um, that we could have. Uh, let's see, look at the first example, no, let's do the second example. Narrative, moral and social foundations of social uh, cyber attack in social media. Uh, and this involves Shannon Bowen from mass communication, in mass communication, Matthew Bershaw in sociology, and, uh, you know, pretty uh, senior people from various other universities. So it involved four or five universities and, uh, you know, at least four of us from our, uh, three of them from our, our university. Um, the next one um, is an interesting one. It is about uh, discrimination based on sex and gender uh, with specific uh, relevance to women's health uh, in, uh, in cardiovascular disease. So this was with uh, University of California, San Francisco's medical school. Um, another one was with Cornell Medicine on uh, improving access to healthcare services for older adults in New York City. And we can conceive of similar one for uh, adults in, uh, in rural South Carolina. Uh, there's another one uh, which was you know, on the topic that uh, would be of interest to your college, um, developing a socio-cognitive computational approach for understanding persuasion through misinformation and its diffusion across social communication platforms. So this was uh, with Amit Almore and Doug uh, Weddell um, in, in, in uh, psychology and, and cognitive science of our campus and variety of other universities. Generally the research uh, you know, and technology that underpin our efforts involve big data. So large volume, variety, where it can be text, uh, data or you know social media text uh, also imagery video sensors multimodal data it also may involve velocity meaning changing rapidly changing information and and uh, veracity uh, truthfulness of the information and the sources um, and then of course it involves uh, artificial intelligence that involves understanding the domain and modeling the domain and uh, natural language processing and machine and deep learning techniques. Um, other topics of possible interest may generally involve social media, news, literature, um, on social media platforms where it data is accessible through APIs such as Twitter, Reddit, 4chan. Data can be multimodal as I said before. And we go you know, very often we uh, do analysis at a very large scale from uh, tens of millions of tweets to billions of tweets or, uh, or, or millions or tens of millions of Reddit posts. Analysis may involve uh, time, a location, a thematic topic, a people who are communicating, network, how they interact with each other, sentiment, emotion, Intention uh, to, for example, give an exa uh, to give an example. Um, uh, we applied these things for elections, um, and um, we correctly predicted 2012 elections. Um, um, we worked with uh, an election in India, general election. Uh, we uh, correctly predicted Brexit. We correctly predicted. Um, um, Alabama Senate election, uh, previous one of you know uh, 2018. So these are very challenging things, and um, using technology as well as human expertise, um, predicting. Uh, and in our case, we were lucky; we had 100%. Uh, I think um, success rate in prediction predicting elections. Um, I did not, uh, you know, get involved with the 2020 elections. But um, it shows the power of technology. And the technology that was used for um, uh, that work 
uh, actually became, I founded a, commer- a company in 2016 called Cognovi Labs. And that company is at the intersection of emotion and AI. So, you know, public opinion, prediction analysis, marketing, branding, uh, the, you know, uh, drivers of intentions and actions uh, that people make. These are some of the things uh, that the company is in, uh, involved in and we may also do as part of our research. Uh, just, you know, we may go along various dimensions of the same problem. One of the big dimension is um, uh, biases of various kind. And this, this can be an issue of uh, big interest in these biases appear in information and communication. So um, there's a historical bias that uh, most of the uh, CEOs have been uh, men. Uh, so the AI system can fail to uh, you know, really detect the role of women uh, or uh, you know, the databases may have uh, uh, people only from one part of the world and it just does not reflect uh, China and India, for example, that have majority the population on internet and many other things of that nature. Uh, you try to talk about uh, arrest and crime and suddenly it uh, um, has a race-based uh, bias and so on and so forth. So these are, we can also study the issues from a uh, variety of respect. I'm just giving you uh, this one example of bias. So, um, one dimension that we'll talk about is uh, from social good to a social ugly or social bad or social harm. Um, and um, here are some of the you know, applications um, along which we can discuss, um, uh, you know, we can use technology to understand a lot of issues, a lot of challenges. Um, and recently on a talk along this line, um, I noted that many of us AI researchers are recently spending more time dealing with the negative aspects of um, uh, technology and social media than the positive aspects. I remember that we had a lot of hope and a lot of exciting things going on. For example, we are monitoring Occupy Wall Street and, and Arab, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the unrest in you know Arab countries in 2011, and um, coordination with government and many other things that were happening, development centric things. Nowadays, uh, we seem to be um, the, the the bad people or people with bad intention, or uh, naive people have gotten you know are being buffeted with the technology uh, with negative consequences. And that has meant that um, um, now so much of research and, and effort is going towards um, um, technologies and research uh, that hopefully can reduce those harms and the problems that the technology and social media has um, uh, you know, caused. So with that, I'm going to move to, uh, we're going to move to this one project, uh, uh, context of has husband of harassment detection on social media. And I'm going to request uh, Thilini, uh, who was coordinating this research. She's a PhD student at the AI Institute for, uh, you, know, for you know, she'll give us a high level view of what we are doing. Thilini, to you. Thank you, Dr. Shet. Um, and good afternoon, everyone. So uh, our project is Context Aware Harassment Detection on Social Media. Um, so online harassment is just serious issue. So these news clippings show you how serious it is. So online harassment could be a prolonged victimization of a person. So it says 13 years of victimization. Or it could be uh, victimizing vulnerable uh, age group uh, people. Uh, Ultimately result in suicide. So this is a serious issue. So that is why we were trying to tackling it. uh, Dr. Shet, could you move to the next slide? So, uh, when we are trying to uh, tackle harassment in a computational way, there are several challenges that we saw that there are. So, I'm going to briefly discuss three of them. The first uh, 
issue is the sub subjectivity of harassment so uh, harassment uh, what is harassing for somebody might not be harassing to someone else so this could uh, have issues when we try to annotate harassing uh, con content in order to uh, support our models and train our models someone could say that this certain conversation is harassing and someone could say no it is not so this subjectivity it's also uh, always an issue and then ambiguity so in uh, different researchers people could uh, define different types of harassment let's say in this example we can see that there are definitions for offensive language there are definite definitions for hate speech and sometimes these overlap so a single tweet or single interaction could be annotated could fall into both of these categories that that is ambiguity and moving on to sparsity so this is the problem we we are tackling we have tackled uh, with uh, this paper if you can see it in this orange box a quality type of annotated corpus and lexicon for harassment uh, research so this is done by a uh, few of our colleagues so in in here if we look at sparsity uh, we could look at two aspects of sparsity in harassing related, related data one is that people only annotate or try to identify between harassing and non harassing so it's just binary and there is one case there is racism sexism and neither of those so it is three labels but but mostly it is either binary or just three labels but harassing could be in different like several different levels so in our work uh, we were tackling five levels sexual racial appearance related intellectual based and political so uh, if you go into this paper you would see how this type of data set were set uh, identified and used so uh, moving on this is another work we are doing uh, we have been we did and uh, using the data set that i mentioned before so this uh, data were analyzed using two methods so the statistical analysis and linguistic analysis so in linguistic analysis uh, we used a tool called liwc so there are uh, important uh, interesting findings so i'm just explaining two here so uh, we were able to identify that there were high female references in the intellectual harassing corpus and also there were high occurrences of the word i in sexually non harassing corpus Uh, in linguistic analysis and in statistical analysis we we saw that offensive words are common place in both harassing and non harassing corpora so that is an interesting one. and also frequent words are not necessarily necessarily offensive and uh, from this we saw that we need to move on to uh, not individual tweet but conversation so uh, this is another paper that we did uh, this is actually a data set paper where we put out a data set uh, with uh, conversations tweet conversations so we had high school student data set and we were able to identify uh, expand the data set of high school students and extract tweets and then uh, um Uh, give the data set as uh, tweet conversation so interactions so these interactions i want to uh, one important thing is with these interactions in this data set we provide you with emoji emoji keywords and also uh, image keywords so with the tweet you will get the keywords of the keyword keywords of the items in the images attached to these tweets so this is a multi module data set which is important uh these are the descriptive statistics and yeah, yeah. thank you uh, uh, next uh, i'm going to uh, invite uh, ur uh, to discuss uh, online extremism um and radicalization ur yes uh, thank you very much um 
So another type of toxicity uh, on online platforms is online extremism, as we have been uh, seeing uh, more often very recently. And um, in nature, this is a very complicated problem because uh, the language is actually very fluid and it is very difficult to detect. And, and, and it's very difficult to understand uh, how people are using this particular uh, language and how they are uh, employing this uh, toxic behavior specifically. Uh, how this behavior is actually reflected by uh, organizations in, a, in an orche orchestrated manner. So it requires a complicated, it requires a complex uh, or sophisticated solution because this uh, problem is particularly complex. When it is being uh, orchestrated by organization, it is getting more, even more complicated as well. So for that reason, we try to understand actually the nature of this uh, conversation organizations and communications and how we can understand uh, better and at the end how we can uh, counter uh, this particular problem on social uh, media platforms. Mm -hmm. So um, so when we were to give uh, some example, for example, just to illustrate what the problem is in general, uh, just the gist of the problem we are trying to uh, uh, solve here. So for example, when we talk about extremism, we can think about one way, one kind of extremism, uh, which is Islamist extremism. And Islamist extremism, uh, we can think about some of the keywords or some of the uh, language that they are using that can be uh, used in different contexts and they can be uh, under, they can have different meanings and understandings. And these differences in their semantics and different uh, meanings it is going to affect the uh, performance or the detection uh, algorithms performance uh, in general. So, and it's going to have uh, uh, serious implications when these models are being employed in real world uh, applications. So for example, in these example tweets, uh, so when you think about jihad, so the people are talking talking about jihad uh, from different perspectives and from different uh, dimensions. And as jihad is a very important and very buzzword for Islamist extremism specifically, uh, and the, 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 the meaning of this uh, keyword is changing. For religion, for example, it means kindness or it can be uh, some kind of effort to become a better person. On the other hand, uh, for hate, it is actually about uh, killing other people or uh, harming other people in general. On the other hand, it has another meaning for uh, ideology of uh, Islamist extremism. Uh, so it can be uh, a form of uh, uh, ideological fight uh, so that uh, so there, there would be some kind of reward at the end. So uh, to be able to differentiate all of these is going to require uh, a different uh, approach for, for this type of algorithms. So uh, when you think about algorithms that you can use to differentiate all of these, so you can think about, for example, clustering algorithms uh, based on machine learning and deep learning. Uh, however, all of these algorithms are going to be based on uh, data sets. And just relying on the data set is going to give you uh, a representation of these keywords uh, based on the relationships that you can find in the data set. Uh, however, in the data set, still, these connections or the relationships are so vague. For example, when you th think about jihad, it would be represented actually very close to violence. Also, it can be represented very close to God or prayer. It, the same thing, uh, the paradise, for example, it can be represented uh, very close to violence and very close to prayer. So it's very difficult to differentiate from each other. On the other hand, when you actually give some prior knowledge to the algorithm beforehand, as it is being conceptualized in a, in a graph format, and you can actually just separate them differently and uh, connect them or give the relationships uh, of jihad to violence or killing or, or, or paradise, for example. And on the other hand, you can give the relationships of jihad with prayer and God and paradise. So as you give this particular prior knowledge uh, of 
uh, based uh, for the relationships of jihad beforehand to the algorithm. So it is going to give the contextual understanding of the communications to the algorithm. So algorithm can actually perform much better. So based on this premise, so we have come up with an approach actually uh, to address these challenges. And the challenges are, so how to capture the context and how to reduce false alarms uh, and also the ambiguity because all the, this is all ambiguous and you need to actually disambiguate uh, and separate these different meanings of, of the same concept. And also a bias and transparency as well as a multimodality. So, so these are all challenges that we have in this particular communications, but the knowledge, incorporating knowledge into the machine learning algorithms can actually address some of these problems. Uh, maybe not 100% resolve the problems. It may not be possible, but it can actually improve, mitigate some of the uh, problems uh, that we have over here. So for that reason, we have come up with an approach where we define three different dimensions of the, uh, of the content uh, for this particular problem of uh, Islamist extremism. So we defined uh, religion, ideology, and hate. And these are all based on the literature, previous literature, and the uh, data observations that we, that we have previously. And we combine the, uh, the, the, the pre-trained, we combine pre-trained uh, models that we learn from this particular domain-specific corpus as well as the uh, knowledge graphs that we had uh, for one of the uh, dimensions that we have, which is religion in this case. And, uh, and at the end, we have come up with actually, uh, in general, a better performance. We have uh, come up with a better performance it, at the end. But more importantly, we were able to identify, uh, actually you can, Go to the next slide. So we, we, we were able to identify some of the outlier users actually in the data set. So in that means when you represent the users for each, based on each of these dimensions, religion, ideology, and hate, you can actually observe some of the users that are very separate and that are very uh, far from other users in general. And this actually uh, gave us some kind of uh, suspicion that there might be some outliers, meaning that these people were actually labeled by Twitter as extremists, but they may not be extremists at all. So for that reason, we, uh, uh, did some further investigations that we confirmed that these are actually non-extremists. So this is an this is an important problem to address actually a potential unfair situation in this case. Great, thanks. Uh, um, uh, next, we're going to move on to health and epidemiology of, of, uh, related topics and um, particularly uh, focus on addiction related research that we have. And Usha is going to uh, present us uh, uh, this bit here. Usha is a PhD student. Go ahead, Usha. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shir. Um, so we are going to uh, introduce our several projects we have on addictions and public health. So one of them, uh, we can start with three doses, uh, which is our first project uh, on prescription drug abuse, online surveillance, and epidemiology. So this project uh, deals uh, about uh, uh, monitoring illicit use of pharmaceutical opioids. And uh, it helped us in capturing the behaviors and attitudes of uh, prescription drug abusers on social media and the forums. Especially, uh, we detected uh, uh, non-medical use of pharmaceutical opioid buprenorphine on uh, uh, social media with the help of drug abuse ontology. And we also determined uh, spatial temporal patterns and trends in pharmaceutical uh, opioid abuse. So this is a semantic abstraction and annotation of how we approach this task. So as you can see, uh, we are able to identify uh, entities related to buprenorphine, which has a slang term UP and also has slang term dupe. So we achieved this uh, uh, entity identification through drug abuse ontology, which has uh, several classes and slang terms and synonyms related to uh, pharmaceutical uh, terms. 
and uh, usually uh, these terms are not used on the chemical names or the original forms of these uh, drugs might not be uh, used heavily on social media but instead people tend to use slang terms so you can see in this example uh, where we are able to identify dosage intervals relationships sentiments and the route of administration of this drug and pronouns um, so these are the triples we are able to identify from this social media text uh, we an we anonymize this uh, social media test not to identify the original source of communication okay next slide so i just wanted to mention that uh, this project led to what is uh, termed in literature as lofremide discovery so uh, we um, found um, uh, that uh, lopramide was used for uh, managing uh, withdrawal uh, uh, from the use of, uh, uh, you know, uh, these uh, prescription drugs. Uh, and um, this was uh, maybe known by um, assorted toxicologists, toxicology, but never reported. So when we published in 2013, this article um, not only became highly cited, but it was followed up by uh, toxicology studies, uh, citing our, uh, you know, publication, and that le led to an FBA warning in 2016. Um, so this, you know, such work can have pretty significant impact. So the next NIDA funded project is eDrug Trends, uh, which deals with trending social media analysis to monitor cannabis on social media. So this is a NIDA funded project to identify emerging trends in this area, integrating the fields of drug abuse research and artificial intelligence. So uh, we define this project as a semi-automated semi platform to identify these trends. And we compare attitudes and behaviors related to cannabis users across different US re regions with different uh, legalization policies of cannabis. And we also analyzed uh, social network characteristics because uh, we, uh, uh, determine the key influencers in cannabis related discussions on Twitter, whether it is an individual or media or uh, whether it is official or retailer. You can move to the next slide. Doctor. Okay, the key innovation of our approach in EDA trends is the adaptation of uh, state of art algorithms in AI to meet the unique needs in drug abuse research. For this, we relied on web forum and social media data. And this pipeline shows the overall architecture of our uh, semi-automated platform. So we have drug abuse ontology to identify uh, terms related to social media. And we have data processing done with entity identification, disambiguation, sentiment, and user location, social network analysis. Then we move on to tools like Kibana, and we rely on uh, tools like Kibana to visualize our analysis. And uh, for data interpretation, we have qualitative and quantitative methods to analyze the data. So uh, the outcome of feedback drug trends, uh, the result of this uh, semi-automated platform, we uh, landed up in several publications. So the first two deals with uh, uh, analyzing the association between cannabis and depression using deep learning techniques, trained on nearly 10,000 samples of manual annotated Twitter data with four labels, treat, cause, effect, and addiction. So this data set is made public for future research in this area. And the time for DAB's work, uh, the third and fourth work analyzing Twitter data on butane hash oil and marijuana concentrates. So this is, this, the goal of these two works is to examine differences in volume of hash oil related tweets among states, uh, as I said, with various legalization policies and to describe user behaviors uh, towards the use of butane hash oil products. So the next uh, time for DAB uh, work also deals with uh, the same, but it explores Twitter data on marijuana concentrate use. And the objective of when bad is good study is to describe the development of supervised machine learning techniques to automatically classify tweets and identify sentiment by the source of communication, whether it is per personal, official, or retail, expressed in cannabis and synthetic uh, cannabis related tweets. And the next work, those edibles hit hard. It investigates Twitter users' perceptions of edibles. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. So the next project uh, is also an IDA-funded project, uh, which is EDA Trends. This project is to monitor crypto markets to identify emerging trends of illicit synthetic opioid use. The motive is to design responsive prevention and policies for pu public health professionals. 
And in this project, we monitor darknet supply and marketing trends over time. And this is possible uh, by providing time, timely data to uh, institutes like uh, national drug early warning systems. Uh, this is the pipeline of our dark trends architecture. So we uh, move on uh, from collecting the crypto market data from several crypto markets. And uh, it tracks trends in illicit synthetic opiate supply and marketing on three crypto markets over a 20 month period. So the markets we considered will be Dream Market, Tochka, Empire, and Wall Street. Uh, so we specifically focus uh, on US focused uh, crypto markets for this study. And we move on from uh, data cleaning and identification till we have emerging trend alert for end use. So this resulted in several publications. Uh, so the first work, Global Trends Local Harms, is very interesting because it examined changes in the availability of fentanyl. Fentanyl, fentanyl analogs, and other opioids and crypto markets with the trends in uh, overdoses in Ohio to provide timely information for epidemiological surveillance. And the next project uh, listed for sale, uh, it analyzes the crypto market data using a, a, a near algorithm to identify opioid drugs, to analyze the trends in terms of listings of fentanyl, their weights, prices, and you know shipment origins on crypto markets. So we made this uh, data public. And the next interesting uh, study is drug abuse ontology, which proved effective in adding knowledge to our deep learning models. Uh, so let, uh, let me hand over the next presentation to Dr. Roor. Sure. Uh, thank you, Usha. So uh, this particular project is uh, in collaboration with the Ohio State University. And uh, in this particular work, we are looking at the substance abuse uh, prevalence in general, and uh, specifically in the mid Midwest uh, states of, uh, of the United States. Uh, but in specifically, we have been focusing on the state of Ohio specifically. And uh, our motivation in general is uh, how the prevalence of opioid is actually uh, impacting uh, on the well-being of the individuals and society overall. So we are exploring the uh, associations between the opioid uh, prevalence uh, in the social media conversations and the mental health and suicide risk uh, prevalence as well. So uh, we are uh, employing our existing research uh, for uh, overall extracting information from these conversations and uh, filtering because social media data is very noisy uh, and also location extraction as well. Uh, and we are employing our uh, knowledge graph knowledge infused uh, natural language processing approaches in this particular work to uh, extract uh, information related to opioid prevalence as well as uh, mental health and social uh, suicide so we are uh, so we are uh, we have been looking at the uh, the associations in general as how the uh, this opioid prevalence is being linked or associated with the uh, prevalence of mental health and suicide. And what we found was uh, substance use addictive disorder specifically uh, was uh, linked with a higher uh, correlation uh, to opioid. On the other hand, after that, uh, gender dys dysphoria and uh, dissociative and OCD disorders, so they're co correlating moderately. But more importantly, we found actually uh, in, uh, High, high correlations uh, for suicide ideation. So according to CSSRC, uh, which is the uh, uh, established scale for uh, suicide uh, assessment, uh, suicide ideation is the initial stage and it has the highest correlation uh, with the uh, opioid prevalence in general. Uh, so mild severity level of suicide risk, uh, which is the um, uh, uh, suicide behavior, it is, uh, it has the uh, ha still high correlation, but it is uh, lesser than the suicide ideation. So, uh, however, the weak correlation uh, we have is the suicide indication. Suicide indication is not specifically stated for the, uh, in the CSSRS, but suicide indication is actually, we can consider that right before the suicide ideation, but it is still weak correlation and we are seeing higher correlation for the suicide ideation and other uh, levels of suicide risk in general. All right, so um, uh, the next one uh, brings us to um, uh, the 
current times, um, we uh, launched this project uh, because um, I, it was a live, you know, we started seeing articles that um, um, because of coronavirus and various, um, uh, you, you know, there will be severe impact uh, on mental health and addiction. So we wanted to study this. Let me see if this plays and tell me if there is any problem. We're going to present psychedelic and afford at uh, the AI Institute at University of South Carolina to use AI and big data to get deep insight in, into what is coronavirus doing uh, to the society. This is once in a century event, and it is impacting health, economy, and social well-being. Expert, experts have been warning us about significant impact of this pandemic on mental health, addiction, and gender-based violence. And we can tap into tweets posted by millions of users that uh, discuss their challenges with respect to all these aspects that we want to study. Uh, approach involves using deep domain knowledge about issues of mental health and um, addiction and combine that with deep learning algorithms to use what we call as knowledge infused natural language processing. We will be able to, we've been able to use this on a corpus of over 800 million tweets and 700,000 news articles. We defined an empirical social quality index called SQI that aggregates over these challenges. Our analysis focuses on relative SQI between states, especially how states are changing in their relative ranking over time. Of course, the prevalence of COVID-19 affects SQI. Right now, some states are doing well and some are just managing, but that isn't the whole story. SQI is also likely the effect of external events, in particular government restrictions and coping responses. In fact, patterns of SQI change emerge that cluster states together. For example, during a four week period, these states start out okay, but decline as indicated by the increasing yellow color. Group of states shows different patterns of reactions. This is how SQI is changing over four weeks of time. States such as Wisconsin, Rhode Island, Nevada, Connecticut shows a non monotonous effect in SQI. On the other hand, Midwest showed a monotonous worsening in SQI. Interestingly, congested states like Illinois, New York, Massachusetts showed an improvement in SQI. To further illustrate why such a behavior has been observed, we analyzed the language in Twitter. Disambiguating and contextualizing the tweets using medical knowledge graphs, we observe patterns of improvement in conditions, which is seen in, as a decline in the tweets on depression, addiction, and anxiety. Much of these is due to meditation, yoga, indoor games, and increased use of streaming video platforms. Among many external factors, financial events and specific government interventions have substantial effect in the social quality of people specifically business and individual relief announcements, business closures, increase in unemployment, and stay-at-home orders. Whenever the unemployment increase is much more significant than the previous week, the social quality is worse. And whereas whenever the individuals and businesses are given financial relief, the social quality is getting better. What are you doing? Concerning coping with the pandemic, our content analysis shows different generations react to react to the pandemic differently. For example, Gen Z population takes the lockdown as a vacation, talking about video gaming and Netflix shows, but also drug abuse and abuse in their families. On the other hand, millennials are more worried about social distancing, unemployment, and government response. As you probably observed, this is a powerful tool that gives you real-time insight into how the policy actions impact the society, and it can also help plan for other challenges ahead. 
You're welcome to get more information at the link provided. So um, uh, this research has continued further um, and now we have analyzed uh, more than 2 billion tweets and um, we'll hope to have in a couple of weeks uh, uh, the much more longitudinal analysis of the same thing. The last uh, part that I want to discuss relates to um, uh, mental health issues, depression and other things. Um, this, uh, this is a joint project with um, Will Cornell Medicine. And here we wanted to understand mental health uh, from social media, both Twitter and Reddit, at massive scale uh, with uh, multimodal data, text and images, um, clinical documents also, uh, analyzing clinical documents. And um, we also work in this area on developing virtual agents or chatbots. Uh, this involves collaboration with domain experts, um, people uh, who have studied and know mental health, practitioners, uh, psychiatrists who actually practice uh, this kind of thing. Um, we use uh, clinical knowledge uh, extracted from uh, the manual that uh, all, all uh, mental health professionals use called DSM-5 um, to enhance the state of the art deep learning and uh, NLP National language processing or understanding techniques. And the work has targeted a variety of audiences. It could be, um, you know, uh, patients, uh, if especially with chatbots. It could be mental health experts, uh, for example, in social suicide ideation. It could be clinical researchers, and it can also be policymakers, like in psychedelic. So, uh, just to give you a, a quick snapshot, here is a, a post, uh, I believe, on like LinkedIn. And um, you try to use the best state-of-the-art algorithm. Uh, and um, you say what mental condition this uh, reflects. Uh, the algorithm would likely say de uh, depression, but the real uh, answer is obsessive compulsive disorder. And... Uh, um, uh, what you really need to get to is to understand what those terms mean and their context. So here uh, you see on the right hand side, there are a variety of um, you know, terms and what they relate to in terms of medical concepts. That kind of deeper understanding is valuable. Um, in this case, uh, you have a variety of uh, mental health conditions and variety of uh, you know, sources of data and the fact that there are some terms here about um, uh, certain medical condition uh, in uh, you know all the posts in this uh, you know subreddit don't relate to this uh, you know topic. They may actually be classified in a different topic. So these kind of things are very very challenging. One of the at a very high level, uh, what we try to do is to um, infuse the knowledge with the deep learning algorithm. Uh, such that then uh, not only you get more accurate, um, uh, you know, results, but uh, what happens is that here you see that the actual term are being replaced by a variety of um, concepts uh, that uh, would be relevant for domain expert to understand. One of the um, things that we learned uh, is that clinic clinicians, for example, uh, even if the algorithms are more accurate, um, they won't necessarily accept uh, use of AI. Uh, the main, one of the main uh, stumbling block is that they would want the solutions to be explainable. Uh, they would want to say, how did you come to this uh, uh, decision, this, this solution, this prediction? And uh, if you can't explain it, then um, they can't trust the system and then they would not use it. So the techniques that we develop are especially well suited to make uh, you know, uh, the, the, the algorithm more interpretable and explainable. Um, other things that happen is that as you uh, involve um, uh, more knowledge, you can see here, these are the involvement of the knowledge from the standard statistical techniques and lexical and statistical techniques from 30% um, you know, error rate, you can get down to 3% error rate. 
So that is a massive improvement in the quality of results and performance of algorithms also. There's some work, uh, the, some other works uh, that we won't be discussing, but let me just mention the title. So this one is Knowledge of an Assessment of Severity of Suicide Risk for Early Intervention. And the, this, this estimates the severity of suicide risk of an individual without the use of clinical authorized questionnaire. Um, uh, and uh, it, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 on the social media, uh, the roles and behavior of user change. Uh, of course, you have sparsity in clinical specific, uh, clinician specific information and uh, challenges in routing questionnaires that uh, clinicians use. So um, this, question, this particular study was able to accurately identify um, uh, that this post is for somebody asking for help. This post is uh, supporting, um, you know, the, somebody who is asking for help. And the other important thing is that we are able to um, do the analysis um, using the uh, clinical guideline uh, that professionals are used to using. In this particular case, Columbia Suicide Severity Rating Scale. Um, and um, there's another uh, uh, paper that just came out. This one is Knowledge Infused Extractive Summarization of Clinical Diagnostic Interview. Um, and, and the point here is that, um, so suppose you have a, a, a conversation between a clinician and a patient, uh, and the patient comes after six months or three months for a second visit. Uh, how can you give the um, clinician a quick overview? Um, on average, uh, there was 56 sentences exchanged between um, uh, physician and uh, patients in our corpus. Uh, this uh, technique uh, reduced that to seven sentences. Uh, that can quickly give an overview uh, to the physician uh, uh, about what happened last time and get on, get, get on with the new visit. And uh, the summarization, uh, you know, heavily uses the mental health knowledge, uh, which is one of the unique aspects of our uh, research. The uh, next uh, um, topic uh, relates to the um, disaster. So we have had uh, 11 years of uh, NSF-funded research on disaster management. And um, let me explain that using this. The disaster director technology provides situational awareness to access first responders and humanitarian organizations in relief coordination during natural disasters. My name is Amit Sheth. I'm the executive director of the Ohad Center of Excellence in Knowledge and Computing at Rice State University. Of and course, this thing has moved along here. Developing technology and solutions for social good. Millions of people use social media to share information during many events, including disasters. At Noesis, we have been collaborating with a wide variety of domain experts to perform scientific analysis of social and sensor big data during many major natural disasters in real time. What if a tool can analyze, summarize, and draw insights from streaming social media messages, every tweet, every image, associated sensor and satellite data, and know every relevant location to help government and humanitarian organizations, as well as first responder and volunteer networks to coordinate the response? Disaster record is that tool. Twitter users provide witness accounts of the unfolding situation and share their critical needs during natural disasters. Disaster hey, Record provides value for those individuals in need and seeking to fulfill those needs by reaching out to the audience for their social feeds. But after some feedback we got from professionals from the humanitarian world, Disaster Record now provides aggregate analysis and summaries for governmental agencies and humanitarian organizations, allowing them to monitor and help affected people. We are considering the example of Chennai Floods 2015 in this demo. Let's choose a time range. The tool then provides aggregated and individual level functionalities. Now let us zoom into the Chennai airport area and see what is happening there. We should draw a bounding box to do the aggregation to see rescue and shelter needs clustered by location names. The word cloud here provides the thematic summaries of what is happening in that area. There is a theme of airport remaining shut for a while. And when we go to tweets, we would see in this example that it says the airport will remain shut 
until December 6th. When you click on the shelter needs, the word cloud themes would change to help, togetherness, and so on. If you click on the Chennai airport location name, you would see that somebody two kilometers away is offering shelter to people stuck in the airport and gives a contact number. You can now click on these icons to peek into the images coming from that same area. This picture, for example, shows the airport runway flooded with two persons in it. You can also see in the pictures of vehicles an airplane in the middle of the flooded runway. Now, let's switch to the individual level of analysis. The legend on the right shows the different markers on the map. The visible flooded areas come from the satellite images using the flood mapping method along with the open street map location features. Let's take this example tweet. It asks for rescue help for elders. We can match it with the location available according to the knowledge from the satellite images and provide turn-by-turn -turn directions. This functionality allows decision makers to communicate the needs with the available locations, which can afford the response. The disaster record technology provides. All right. So uh, that is uh, what we had uh, for uh, presentations. And now um, we are available for um, uh, conversation. Questions, anything that you want to discuss. Uh, we have plenty of time. Great. Thank you all so much. Very interesting research. And yes, as you said, a lot of overlap with um, some of the interests in our college. So now we'll just open it up for questions. Uh, feel free to, you know, unmute yourself and ask out loud, or if people want to type something in the chat, we can answer questions that way or have a discussion that way. Any questions from anybody? Or anybody want to introduce themselves and talk about possible collaborations? Hi, Brooke. Thank you all very much. Um, very interested in hearing about the AI research. I'm interested in what and how you're pursuing knowledge graph and um, how you're trying to capture the domains in the knowledge graphs to enhance the the deep learning algorithms. Talk a little bit more about that. Sure. Yeah, um, let me see if. Uh... I will uh, probably open up this presentation. I mean, it's my understanding that you work with domain experts to begin to sort of create semantic and computationally intelligible um, graphs that you could then use to enhance the learning. Is that a fair representation of the technique? Uh Right, but it doesn't have to be limited to just uh, working with um, domain experts. Uh, so it is not limited to um, uh, uh, kind of manual um, knowledge engineering. Uh, it can be a semi-automated or heavily automated process. So the knowledge graphs are created in many different ways. Um, uh, Let's see, uh, there are, these are, you know, whole variety of work we have done in knowledge graph. This is, uh, so this particular slide discusses that um, uh, we were, shows a technique where uh, we do um, uh, extraction of new facts um, that is not already in the knowledge graph or, into, or ontology and um, uh, propose that as uh, enhancement of existing knowledge uh, which is uh, done with the human expert uh, curation or, or, or approval. Uh, so there are techniques uh, that would, um, you know, bring knowledge graphs, um, uh, sorry, build the knowledge graph, keep them up to date. Now, in our work over the period of time, and actually I had, a, you know, the first commercial company uh, that, for semantic search using knowledge graph was the company I founded in 1999. Yeah about 13 years before Google came out with semantic search uh, with knowledge graph. So um, uh, there the knowledge graph was created from extracting knowledge from uh, many structured and semi-structured sources. Um, you know, a good, a very good example is Wikipedia and DBpedia is often used as a knowledge graph in some cases. Now the uh, knowledge graph and knowledge representation is a very challenging uh, issue uh, by the way, some companies have built massive amount of knowledge graphs, and um, uh, many of them have um, 
uh, manual process. Uh, Google, uh, there was a, um, I was giving a keynote at a big conference, like 600 audience in China on just knowledge graph. And my, the guy who introduced me came from Google. And he, he told me that at Google, there were 10,000 people working on a Google knowledge graph. So it can be very manual process, but the uh, company that I mentioned I had done, uh, I only had two and a half people, uh, uh, you know, uh, that was maintaining pretty large knowledge graph. Uh, so it depends on, yeah, so this was, for example, you know, uh, a knowledge graph that was developed in year two, around 2000. And we, we were granted a patent in this area also. Uh, and so th this kind of shows you the tools that we had used in those types uh, to build this knowledge graph. Um, now, um, the, um, let me go to the, uh, uh, in the recent days, uh, so uh, Usha talked about drug abuse ontology. That was done uh, manually uh, with humans and tools. Uh, then um, we have uh, uh, various knowledge graph for, so we talked about knowledge for mental health um, that, or uh, knowledge for radicalization. That were done semi-automatically with some guidance from human and using tools. Um, these are, uh, okay, so all the ways uh, knowledge is used and exploited. Uh, let me, I'm right now going towards uh, one important part of the question that you asked um, on, on the uh, uh, use of knowledge graph. So what happens is that there are a range of techniques uh, that have been developed uh, to um, you know, use the knowledge graph along with deep learning. Uh, and in our uh, you know, work, which is one of our you know, key areas of original research in AI, is called knowledge-infused learning. So uh, uh, what we do is um, the develop uh, techniques that um, uh, what we call as do shallow infusion, uh, essentially, what, it, what, what, what you do there is to take the knowledge and flatten it and represent it in a, in, a, in, a, in a vector form in the same way that a deep learning will do uh, to, a, uh, you know, to a data, to data source or corpus. And then combine the two to improve uh, the importance of some words and then you know, some understanding of the meaning. The next uh, level is um, semi-deep infusion technique. Uh, this is the technique that was used in the example we gave, uh, that the, the example Ur gave for um, uh, radicalization problem. So there we created knowledge graph from Hadith and uh, religion knowledge graph from Hadith and uh, Quran. Uh, and we created uh, uh, knowledge graph um, for, for you know, ideology knowledge graph from, from uh, some book, uh, books and other, other sources. So, and then these knowledge graphs were uh, incorporated into the uh, deep learning pipeline at one level. And uh, that leads to, uh, you know, more uh, targeted infusion of knowledge into the uh, knowledge, uh, into the deep learning algorithm. And now we are working on what, we, what is called as uh, deep infusion technique, <clears throat> in which case, um, uh, the, uh, both the uh, data is represented at a different level of abstraction, knowledge is also represented at a different level of abstraction. And we try to uh, incorporate the knowledge at the levels of different levels of abstraction in a deep learning pipeline. So that is a uh, sort of a, a emerging technique uh, that is uh, at, the, at the, the kind of age of uh, you know, current um, research. So Thank you. I think you know, uh, this, the, the, there is a lot of detail here and um, uh, we actually have a couple of uh, large tutorials, um, uh, you know, or, or, or three hour tutorials that explicitly deal with, um, I think, knowledge graphs. So here is a, a tutorial on um, uh, knowledge infused deep learning. And then there's a tutorial on explicitly using knowledge graphs, which also, so, those uh, techniques and uh, shows why uh, you can build explainability. Excellent. Thank you. Um, hi, Dr. Shas. Hi. Um, 
I want to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Shu Dan Huang. I'm a second year PhD student of SJMC. My research area, area is healthcom and PR. Um, I think um, what you introduced today is very wonderful and very cool. Like a lot of knowledge that we don't know. So I have two questions for you. One is, um, well, the AI Institute, Institute offer any um, like workshops or seminars or short courses for to train students like in social science to to learn some like basic things about this. Um, second question is that um, I'm very interested in this area. Um, is there any further cooperation opportunities? Thank you. So. Um, um... I used to offer interdisciplinary courses, um, you know, in my previous uh, job and my, you know, time for teaching is more limited. So uh, right now we don't have ex courses, uh, formal courses that are explicitly for, uh, you know, uh, you know, target to any, you know, non-computer science uh, students. And yet at the same time, um, through these collaborations, um, we encourage and invite <clears throat> students from any discipline to um, uh, get engaged. And in the process, we give them the necessary training. The, the, the training comes by hands-on working with our students. So <clears throat> in my talk, I discussed several projects um, um, uh, that uh, involved, uh, part, let's say, working with a cognitive scientist. And, um, uh, uh, her name is Valerie Shalin, and her PhD students have frequently worked as served as their committee, and uh, they, you know, will have weekly meetings. So, so she will come, and we will also, um, uh, uh, by working jointly with the other PhD students, they would uh, essentially get hands-on experience. <coughs> we will have some uh, places to learn. There are two other. Um, uh, uh, opportunities to uh, get basic learnings. In the summer, in July, uh, first week, uh, we are uh, offering um, a summer uh, camp, uh, AI camp for high school students. Uh, and there we'll kind of introduce, you know, stuff and we'll record that. These tutorials that we I talked about, they are also recorded. Plus, for example, Forrest um, uh, is here on the call. Uh, I have other colleagues. <coughs> They are teaching AI courses, and all of them have their lectures um, available online. Uh, I am teaching right now a course uh, that could be a good course because it is an overview course, it's a seminar course, but gives you an overview of a lot of AI technology. So it does not go deep into one specific technology. But the course that, for example, my colleague Chi, who was on the call earlier, I don't see him now, uh, or the one that Forrest teaches, or um, um, Biplo Srivastava, another colleague teaches course on natural language processing. They all recorded or they can be audited. So you can see uh, in those courses. Um, one, one way I would think is that for somebody who is not in computer science, uh, auditing such a course, you are a research assistant, you can do that, uh, would be quite possible. And um, uh, you get a, I think, decent experience. You don't have to really take. Um, exams and worry about the grades, but you can really get a good exposure to the, to, to the, to, to the field. So we have courses in natural language processing, in broad AI, in deep learning, and all, all the kind of fields. So that you can do certainly. So um, did you also, are, hmm. should we mention the size social workshop as well? I, I can't remember when it is off the top of my head. I just remember when the paper reviews are due. But I think um, Amit or Agur could tell us a little bit more about that. I mean, which, which workshop? The Sci Social one. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, there are, yeah. Uh, go ahead, Agur. Yeah, sure. Um, so we are organizing a workshop this year. Uh, we organized already the first one last year, uh, a workshop at the uh, ICWSM conference, which is uh, specifically about uh, social media uh, um, communications and how you can actually uh, apply computational techniques and computational models 
uh, and it's a very uh, premium uh, conference, a top tier conference, and uh, we are going to organize the second workshop at this uh, conference this year. And the theme of the workshop that we organize is uh, specifically for the uh, social harm issues on online platforms. Uh, it can be about misinformation or extremism or toxicity, harassment, or anything that you can think of as social harm and how you can actually apply computational models to, to these problems, as well as how you can uh, apply social theories uh, to these problems and how you can draw um, or, or how you can uh, come up with computational models based on these social theories. Uh, so it's an interdisciplinary platform where we want researchers from different disciplines can actually gather and then interact with each other and then come up with uh, a particular uh, research uh, collaborations and solutions uh, specifically. And we are going to have some talks uh, from uh, researchers and scientists from different disciplines, social science and computer science. And hopefully they are going to provide a some level of uh, information and knowledge uh, about these particular uh, issues so that you can benefit from. Uh, maybe uh, you can, we can communicate offline uh, and uh, maybe you can even involve actually in the, uh, in the workshop. So that is going to give you a broader uh, exposure. Yeah, thank you very much for the information. And could you please share the links or the Sure. Um, was in the, yeah. I'm going to do it right now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? So one yeah. person asked just about general other work that was going on at the AI Institute. So I just wanted to share some. So um, Amit and I have been collaborating with people in education to work on ways one can collaborate with AI to learn how to solve problems that um, you previously didn't know how to solve. So we had some uh, work before on using AI to solve the Rubik's Cube, which is something people like to learn how to do. And while the AI itself can learn you know, by itself to solve it, it won't be able to teach you how to solve it if you don't know. So what we're looking at right now is how we can um, collaborate with AI so that we're looking at right now high school age students can find personalized solutions to these kinds of problems and so they can learn how to solve this problem but learn how to solve it in a way that they understand and then uh, furthermore we're also looking at how this can be used for say research so say um, you're working on a problem that has never been solved and you want to collaborate with this AI system to hopefully solve it in a way that you can understand and you know solve this problem that nobody else has solved. So I just want to put this link in the chat. This is an article in the conversation that I wrote about this, if anybody is interested. Yeah, there's a lot of, uh, so uh, Forrest talked about work on education, there's work on, um, uh, many, many other fields that is going on. The general work in um, um, conversational AI or uh, conversational chatbot, uh, uh, that is also going and you can use this kind of technology to many areas. Um, right now, uh, the main area happens to be education, uh, areas happen to be education and um, health, chronic disease management in particular. Okay, great. So Thanks if there's no the question, way. perhaps group we can wrap up. Okay. Any other questions, comments, discussion? Last call. All right. Um, if not, I just want to say thank you so much again, Amit and your whole team, and thank you all for joining us today. I look forward to future collaborations. Uh, thanks. Thank please, you all. Please share the link when you have it for the video. Yes, I will. I'll send it to you. Thanks. Thanks, Amit.